Good morning. It's good to have you all here. I really enjoy here. You can tell we're having a fun time here this morning already. <laughs> I'm sure even online you heard some of that. But anyway, it's great to have so many here today. We do have some visitors with us from NSU, and Andrew Weininger is going to bring the morning message. But Andrew and his family are here, and I think there's another family coming. So anyway, we're really excited to have so many here this morning. I do have just a couple of announcements. I forgot this one last week. The board at our last board meeting uh, voted to give $3,000, two $3,000 gifts, special gifts, to our, uh, to our missions. Eden Ministries was to feed the village campaign to help provide food for the whole uh, Eden Christian Ministries. And then to Daughters of Ruth, it was to help pay school tuition, or maybe to pay all of it. We're not exactly sure how many, but it was a large amount, uh, $3,000 to take care of school tuition for Daughters of Ruth. Also want to let you know, and it's not on the slides yet, but because it's coming up fairly soon, Ron Riley, the director over at Cooks and Hills, will be here as a special speaker on May 16th. Uh, next month is Cooks and Hills month, and so I uh, wanted to make sure that you knew about that. I think that's all the announcements that we need to make, so let's go ahead and sing together. Praise the name of Jesus. <coughs> As we prepare for communion this morning, I want to remind you to have your communion emblems ready so that you might be able to participate during the uh, meditation time. Rock of Ages. Good morning, everyone. This has been a, an exciting week for us. We flew to Minnesota and visit our, visited our kids and our grandkids, and everybody's fine up there. Minnesota's fine, and we're glad to be home. <laughs> I am sure that... Most of you had read, have read the uh, passages dealing with communion. We read them just about every Sunday. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 26 and, seven, and 27 are, are two of the verses that, uh, that we read. Uh, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and, and, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is 
the, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. There's, there's two words in each of those sections um, that we have a tendency to not look at very heavily. We just kind of skip by it. And, uh, and that is, he gave thanks. Now, some would say that, is, that was custom, that was uh, part of the, the uh, process while they were taking the Passover feast. But I think it's more than that. I really do. I think uh, often we, we read this and, and uh, we see that he, he gave thanks. And what, one of the first things we teach our kids, I hope, is to say thank you. We, we, uh, we, we give them something and we expect them to say thank you. When someone else gives them something, we expect them to say thank you. But I think this is deeper for Jesus because he knew what he was about to go through. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew he was going to go through all the painful things that he went through. And I, I, I really believe that he was thanking God not just for the emblems, but also for the opportunity, and, and it was an opportunity, because he, he said, take this cup away from me, Lord, if it be your will, to go to the cross and die the way he did. But then be resurrected on the third day and, and to be with the Father. All that, I really feel like Jesus is thanking God for those opportunities. Amen? Let's go to our emblems. And when we partake of these emblems, let us uh, remember the blessings that Jesus brought to us through his death on the cross. Let's take the bread. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your son giving his body, his life for us, his earthly body, so that we may have everlasting life. And we'll take the fruit of the vine. And thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine that reminds me of your son's blood that was shed on the cross so that we may have that gift of eternal life, so that we may have and we be covered by your son's blood. Thank you, Father. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Time to dismiss for junior church. If you're in middle school on down, we have junior church downstairs. You're welcome to go ahead and do that as we sing this song, The Solid Rock. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's
testing one, two. Test, test, test. Can you hear me? All right. Good deal. <clears throat> Good morning. So my name is Andrew Weininger. Uh, if you call me Andy, I will not correct you. It's okay. My, my dad, they call him Andy. So it's, I'm, I'm used to hearing it. They won't bother me at all. Um, so first and foremost, you know, I'm going to get the business end of this out of the way. Uh, you know, the update of the ministry. Everybody wants to know what's going on. And COVID has definitely made things exciting. Uh, I'm going to use that with, a, with some, some uh, in italics around it or whatever, or, you know, parentheses around it because interesting is, is an understatement. Uh, there is, there's been cancellations of classes, there's been confusion, there's been masks, there's been uh, you know, people that actually hid in their dorms and just wouldn't come out except to get food and go right back to it. And it, is, it has been a challenge. Uh, but on the flip side, we also have been free. We've been free to be able to gather anyway. Uh, we, we didn't have anyone coming over us and, and, and shaking their finger at us and saying, you know, thou shalt not gather together. <laughs> so that is, and we were just really grateful for that. Uh, th that has not been the case everywhere. Uh, friends of mine from uh, from Norman, I've heard I've heard uh, uh, in the bigger schools, especially, they are very much told you will not gather together. In fact, one was almost had the police called on them because they took a sign and they set it out there, and and it just simply said Jesus is the way, and they were just going to have conversations with people. But they said this is potential for people to gather, so you know we, you can't do this. And it was crazy. They, they, they have had issues in other places that are very much unlike ours. Uh, my friend uh, Baxter, he, he, he does every, every Thursday, he does this thing he calls uh, free conversation. And he sets a sign out, you know, very similar to that. And uh, gives people an opportunity to just have a free conversation. And we do that together every now and again. And I, and I remember going over there and helping him with that. And, and it wasn't a big deal, though. You know, nobody, nobody fussed at us. Nobody gave us a hard time, but it just gives us an opportunity to meet students and, and to start a conversation. And, and surprisingly, there have been many times where we've actually been able to have very deep and intimate conversations in that context where students just really needed somebody to talk to. And so that's been really cool to see. So our, uh, our, our vision and our goal is to make disciples of Jesus on the campus at NSU and teach them to obey everything God commanded them. I mean, it's, it's what you'd expect, and, and as we continue to do that, the how keeps changing based on what our context is and what's going on, uh, but, but the what is, is still very much the same. The what is always going to be the same. We, we, are, we are trying to be like Jesus to this world and give people an opportunity to grow in that. We gather on Sunday mornings, and on Sunday mornings we gather together and we give students an opportunity to come uh, where they don't have to go very far. They, they literally can just walk across the street, and they're, they're right there with us on Sunday morning and have that opportunity. We've got some families that are dedicated to, uh, to surrounding themselves around students and encouraging them in the Lord, showing them what it's like to walk as Jesus did in real life. Uh, on Tuesdays nights, we gather. Uh, right now, we're doing the series The Chosen. Has anybody seen The Chosen videos? Yeah? Uh, are we fans or are we not? I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but yeah, so we're going through The Chosen, and, and over the previous years, we have studied a lot of the cultural context using a series called uh, From That the World May Know by Ray Vanderlund, and that is some good stuff. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. If you go to CCF's website, ccfnsu.com, there is a link on there to our uh, resources, and that is one of them. And I, I thoroughly encourage people to read that or, or to visit that and order those videos and study those, those studies because they are extremely good. And uh, as we watch The Chosen, we're able to analyze the, uh, the cultural context that they display there. And, and it's, it's really neat to see some of that put into action and to see it real life. And it has, we've had some interesting conversations based on that. So we're still meeting together on Tuesday nights. Uh, CCF is still emphasizing unity, and so we're working with other campus ministries there on the NSU campus that are Christ-centered, that are, that are trying to uh, help and encourage uh, NSU students. And so I work with uh, a one, one guy named Baxter Stewart and another one named Bryce Stafford. They are uh, leaders of the ministries for the Assembly Church and also for uh, the Baptist uh, Student Union. And so that's uh, really exciting. We, we're really working well together. We're able to gather weekly and encourage each other and pray for each other and fight for each other. <laughs> and uh, I can't tell you how much that has really been a, a huge blessing to all of us all the way around. Uh, and we're still, so we're still working together in unity, still pushing for uh, removing those barriers that, that continue to silo us. And, and, and remember that Jesus, this is something Jesus was very passionate about, that we would all be one in him. 
We don't have to agree on everything, but we can, we can be, agree that Jesus is the way, and we can agree that we're going we're gonna to do everything we can to love students together. Uh, we also did a mission trip for the first time this, uh, this, this year, which is really odd because, you know, you'd think during COVID years and stuff that, uh, that we wouldn't be thinking about that. But Tom came up to me, Tom Tucker, he was the predecessor for CCF, and, uh, and, and he came to me and he says, you know what, I really, I really think we need to still do this. And uh, if you guys are interested in going, let's do it. And he's doing a thing called Christian Parenting Ministry now. And so his goal and vision was that parents would go with their children. And so I thought, this is an excellent opportunity, free training. And at the same time, I get to encourage my kids. So Esther and I, Faith and Jonah, we all went to Mexico, and we built a house. And I got to tell you, putting your faith in practice that way, oh, it, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. And, and it encouraged me very much. And while I was afraid, and, I, and, I, and my dad, of course, you know, he, he's very much, you know, the, the protector of the family. He, he, he told me about all the things that could happen. And I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I went anyway. I stepped out in faith, and I trusted that God was going to fight for me. And, uh, and, and we rode down there, and I mean, I was just, inside I was quivering. Inside I was afraid. I was very much afraid, but God was there every step of the way. And with with Casas por Cristo, they 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 have vans that are labeled Casas on them, so you're not confused about who you're with. And everyone around there has been affected by these people coming through across the border and building these houses for people. So they're in community there. They know who they are, and they are, they're well respected. And so we there was never a time where we felt afraid actually. And and the place where we stayed had 10-foot walls with razor wire over the top. So you even slept okay at night. The food was great, and it was an excellent opportunity to just love the least of these, the people who did not have everything that, that, that we are privileged with. They use outhouses. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> so that was an opportunity to be trained and an opportunity to show the love of Jesus. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to taking students with us next year and, and, and really giving them the opportunity. There were so many opportunities where I was like, oh man, this would be a great time to pull this lesson and, and really, really talk about this particular aspect of walking with God. And, and I was like, this is going to be great. I'm really looking forward to this. So Lord willing, somehow, some way, we will be able to fund the house. We will have plenty of people that are willing to step out in faith and actually build the house and, and, and be able to do that next year. And that, I'm, I'm just really excited about that. All right. So, oh, and last but not least, thank you very much for supporting CCF. These students. They need somebody to fight for them. And we are there to fight for them. And you make it so we can. So thank you. Sorry. Lord, we give you thanks for letting us come together. We give you thanks. For your text, we give you thanks for being close to us. I pray, God, that you will be with us as we look at your word this morning, that you will help me to get out of the way so that you can teach today. I pray that you will fill my mouth with your words, and I pray that you draw near to us, Lord, as we try to draw near to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 23. Does anybody know, has anybody heard this psalm recently? I, I felt that resonate, like almost like it was like, y- y'all must have just did this or something. Uh, I love it. This is probably one of the most quoted psalms in all the free world, uh, aside from Psalm 51, which me and my buddy were going through this the other day. It was really kind of funny. I was like, yeah. Another, another guy I know, he says, uh, he says yeah, uh, psalms are kind of like uh, apps on the app store. You know, there's a psalm for that. <laughs> I love that statement. I I thought it was the greatest thing. You know, yeah, there's a psalm for that. Uh, I love that. That's good. But today we're going to look at Psalm 23. And I'm going to try to help help analyze this particular text from a a context that we may not have always understood. And so um, I'm hoping to bring a little bit of new to the table, but at the same time, try to understand more of the heart of God. So without further ado, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In literary structures, there is this concept called chiasm. Has anybody heard of this? Yeah, a, a lot of people who do a lot of uh, scholarly type research into the text are going to find, oh, hey, Chris, welcome. <laughs> it's good to see you, buddy. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so there is this, this, this concept called chiasm. And, and what chiasm is really, just to keep it really simple, is that there's going to be some repetitions. There's going to be some bookends. There's going to be some information. And it's going to emphasize things. It's going to emphasize things that, that are going to help us understand what it is that God is trying to communicate to us through this written word. And this particular one has an interesting parallel, and it, it's going to shed a lot of light on this. It starts with the Lord, and it ends with the Lord. And this, the Lord is very interesting because it is the personal name of God, Yahweh. And I love that name, and it helps us to understand kind of just a context through which we should view this psalm. So knowing that it starts and ends with Yahweh is extremely interesting. Now, when I think about where that first was actually introduced was in Exodus. You think it would have been, you know, in the beginning, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and the Spirit of God was... No, <laughs> it, it doesn't start that way. No, no, he refers to himself as Elohim then. And that's why I thought, oh, that's interesting. So in Exodus, he says to Moses, from now on, I will be known from, for, for all time as Yahweh. He gives him his per- personal name. And it's interesting, the Hebrew scholars have actually looked at this and said that the Hebrew words for I am, I was, and I will be, if you take those three different Hebrew words and you lay them over the top of each other, you find a very interesting thing is that it kind of, it, 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 it like just right, stack them right on top of one another and they spell out Yahweh. And so that was very interesting to me. Like God, God is wanting to make himself known. And that is one of the emphasis. So, so, so when I look at this text, I want to look at it from this is something that God is trying to communicate to me about who he is. He wants to be known. And so I'm going to look at this text with that in mind. The next little hop in of the parallels, so it begins and ends with God's personal name. Then there's this this context of food and drink, both at the beginning and at the end. We see a context that says green pastures and clear waters, so the sheep have food. And then at the end, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. And so there's food and drink paralleling at the beginning and the end. And you move in a little bit further, and you see that he's going to lead you along right paths for his name's sake. And he's going to, uh, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You are with me. There's the, so there's, the, again, we parallel security, safety. God is with us. And then you move into the next, and, and this is the central idea. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So it's almost like God is making himself known. God is making himself known in the way that he is provider, that God is protector, and he's not going anywhere. I am with you. And so these parallels and these emphasis help us to identify some of these things. There's also beautiful images that the Eastern mind thinks in terms of images, not PowerPoint slides like we do. That's why I didn't make a PowerPoint today. I gave you an image. (laughs) I tried. (laughs) So the idea of shepherd is an image that comes from this text. What is interesting about a shepherd is, is that in the Eastern culture, they lead with voice. They call to their sheep, and they come. A very interesting story that I heard from Ray Vanderland's videos is that he, he, he remembers being there in Israel, and these Bedouin shepherds would come, and they were kind of massing together and having a conversation, and these two different flocks, two or three different flocks come together, and they form this just huge herd, and they're just milling about, and, and he was sitting there thinking, there's no way they're ever going to sort these guys out. But yet, they finished their conversation, they called to the sheep, and they split. They separated, because the sheep know his voice, and they obey, and they follow their shepherd. So in John 10, I I found something really interesting there, where Jesus is using this idea of shepherd. 
And we're going to see this idea being used and reused all through the text. He says, I am the good shepherd, verse 14. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So our God is identifying himself. Again, this passage is about making God known, and this God is a God who leads like a shepherd. He leads by voice. He leads by word. In the beginning, God spoke, and the world came into being. This is another interesting phrase, green pastures. Now, when you think of green pastures and you read this psalm, what do you think of? Like this huge rolling hills with knee-deep alfalfa grass, right? I mean, just this lush, beautiful, I mean, just iconic green pastures. This sheep is going to eat all day, right? But that's not the image. The image from the desert is actually very different. The green pastures he's talking about, you look at that hillside and you look at rocks, you look at dirt, you look at boulders, and you're going, where's the green? But yet, the way the, the, the morning dew works is that it collects in these small little crevices where there's just enough soil, and that seed gets in there, and these little green tufts come up out of the ground, and the shepherd knows where these things collect. So it, 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 it kind of helps us to see this image that our God is the God of not this ridiculous abundance, but that he's going to give you enough for today. And he's, tomorrow he's going to lead you down the, the right paths, which is what's next, so that you will have enough for tomorrow too. And then around the corner, there'll be enough there as well. And, it, and it's, there's this intimacy of knowing and trusting that shepherd that he's going to lead you to the just enough tomorrow. Don't get me wrong. Our God can bless. Our God can show abundance. But there's something about God making himself known in this text that helps us to know that he's also a God who's gonna, who at times is going to provide just enough to get you by. And we will be grateful for that. And listening to him will be extremely important in that moment. Enough for today. Same thing with the rushing waters. or It's not rushing waters. It's quiet waters. The idea of just enough. It's not that he's going to lead you down these river beds where there's all this excess. and it, it, There will be times when you get to go to the En Gettys of the world where there is plenty, and we will be refreshed there, and we will gather up extra water and take it to others. But there's also those times when, when you're out there and it's hot, and it's hard, and he's going to give you what you need to get through. I'm going to skip the next part and come back to it. Going back to the t idea of table, the idea of food and drink. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So there's this thing in Eastern hospitality that when, when you come into a person's house and you eat with them, they, they, they are now honor-bound to protect you and keep you safe. So they will, give, they will very much give their lives before they let you be harmed. So that image carries in this text because as you sit there and you, and you, and you, and you come to the Lord's table, and he prepares this table before you, even though maybe your enemies surround you, he's going to protect you. He's going to watch over you. He's honor-bound to, to, to watch over you. But there's also another side to this story, this idea of uh, what's called a sulha, this idea that I, when, when I'm at odds with someone, I have an opportunity to come and eat with my enemy and be reconciled. So there's, a, there's, there's this hint of reconciliation that's hidden in here too. The heart of God is reconciliation. The heart of God is putting it back together again. The heart of God is let's make this right. And there's this opportunity there that, that in the presence of my enemies, God can put the world back together. God can reconcile me with the one I am at odds with. Mm, that's good stuff. That is the heart of God. It reminds us that we're good with God, and we can be good with each other. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Now, the idea of dwelling in the house of the Lord, and, and there's this concept in, in Israelite culture uh, at that time where, you, where, you, where there's the house of the Father, and the Father has role, has a role, and the first son is the Bachor, and he has a role, and he's, he's, he's got a role to be like the Father to the sons that are after him. And it's interesting because when, when a person gets outside of the house for whatever reason, they've sinned or they've been broken out or, or they were married and then something happened in that marriage and it didn't work out, and then they need a kinsman redeemer. They need an opportunity to be brought back into the Father's house. And, and, and the, the Levitical law, the Mosaic law, had all kinds of things to be able to help reconcile and bring it back and make it right again and to restore that which has been cut off or messed up or left out. And the heart of the Father is to bring that back in. And so it's, it's like this, this role that God provides. It's also this role that, that we are to be like God and be that instrument of peace, be that instrument of putting the, bringing them back in. It also comes with that idea of... Um, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> It also comes with the idea that we can experience the good and love that exists in the presence of God the Father now and forever. We are protected and loved, provided for, we belong, and are a part of his people. And the center of this chiasm is you are with me. So as God is continuing to make him make himself known, he's not going anywhere. Even when we can't, we don't feel him near. He says, I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I will be with you. The shepherd is with us. And we don't need to be afraid. The devil's afraid. But he doesn't fear the sheep. He, he fears the shepherd. But the shepherd is near. And he says, I'm not going anywhere. So as we think about this text, as we think about how it describes who God is and who we are and how he's there, this, 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 this idea and this imagery is, is continued to be leveraged in things like in 1 John 2, verse 3, he says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what, is, what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word... Love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we are, know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So when we say, I'm in Christ, when we say, I'm a disciple, when we say, I, I want to be like Jesus, can we hear his voice? Do we, do we know what he commands? In order to obey his voice, we have to know what his commands are. And the only way we're going to find that is in his text. Do we lead and teach like Jesus? Do we think like Jesus? Do we interpret the scriptures like Jesus does? Do we love like he loves? Or do we love the way the world says to love? I love the, the images from the desert. I love the, how all of these things interplay because they are so useful in terms of how then shall I live. If I'm listening to the voice of God and I'm obeying him, I can use these images to, to understand that I'm right there and that everything's going well because these images are going are gonna to tell me about what, what he's like. What is the father like? What is the son like? And how can I be like the son? So who, who in here are shepherds? Who in here are the... Uh, uh, the elders of the church. You willing to raise your hand? There's one. All right. Okay. So I've got a, a, a little side note there. Is that Jesus comes with some interesting statements about this idea of being like him and being shepherds. And, and, and one particular statement is uh, from John 10 as well. And it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for his sheep. And I know as a fellow shepherd at times, I struggle 
with all the things about how we're either doing it right or we're not doing it right or we should be changing and we should be doing it like this. And I, and I, and I, worry, I worry about the sheep. But sometimes I just, I, I can only think through like one way of dealing with the sheep, man's way. We got to remember to be not like the hired hand. And so my encouragement for you today is to, is to really meditate on that concept. Am I just a hired hand taking after Jesus' sheep? Or do I love the sheep? Am I like the shepherd? And I would encourage you guys to, to really dig deep and, and, and speak with the Lord about these things and let him speak to you and pray for love for the sheep. There are times when I think I love the sheep and then I find out I was hurting the sheep and I didn't even know it. So love the sheep. Be like the shepherd. As we move into a time of invitation, I would just like to really encourage everyone to think about these images from the desert. Think about what, uh, what, what the text communicates to us about God and who God is. Think about your contentment with just enough rather than the ridiculous abundance that we may want. Continue to seek God. Listen to his voice and obey his commands. And be careful because there are many other voices that are plaguing us these days. Voices that are sowing fear. Voices that are sowing dissension. Voices that are saying, these people are out, these people are in. We were told to make sheep, make fish, catch fish, right? I like the pirate or the chosen when he says, just catch the fish. I'll sort them later. Lord God, we give you thanks. I pray, Lord, that you will teach us your ways. Help us to be like you. Help us to listen to your voice. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to convict us each day and help us, Lord, to press on and press closer into you. May we truly love one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a decision to make, Now's a good time. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.